All right, so first of all, close your eyes. It works better. <laughs> I'm just, that's, it's like true, right? He really sounds like this all the time. How many of you are thinking, ooh, I thought he'd be younger, taller, older, <laughs> fatter, or what, right? Everybody. Come on, admit it. <laughs> Thank that's you okay. For, I'm good with that. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Happy to do it. Appreciate it. Helps that you're based here in L.A. Mm -hmm. So... Markets up or down? Did we figure that out? The market's a little bit mixed right now, but look, Dow's over $25,000. I mean, 25000 So, you know, everything's fine. All right. All right. That's not true, <laughs> as you know. So, tell us a little bit about your backstory. I don't think people know. I know. Warren. How much time do we know? How much time do we have? Right? Um, <clears throat> I did not know you were a Navy pilot. Yeah. Makes it even more interesting to understand how you got from that to this. So tell us a little bit I'll, about that. I'll, I'll do the, the super quick version. Uh, I spent eight years in the military, uh, four years in the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, my, wife, my then fiance and I were living overseas in Beijing, uh, working at the embassy. She wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted to do something else with my life after uh, 12 years in government. Um, she got into the MBA program at Stanford. She is, I will say for the record, the brains in the family, especially the financial brains, and that happens to be true. Mm. Um, and I went along uh, because it was 1997, and there was this dot-com thing happening in Silicon Valley, and I said, sure, I could do something like that. And to make a very long story very short, I, I had discovered I had no desire really to be in business in any way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> it's true, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate the irony. Uh, and and uh, I wound up, um, after a very serious talking to uh, from my then wife, because uh, I was 34, freshly married, my wife was a student, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up, and we were about to have a baby, and I was like, what am I doing? Uh, and so I wound up with an internship at KQED, which is the public radio station up in San Francisco, uh, at the age of 34. And 20 years later, here I am. Wow. God, 20 years later. Jesus. <laughs> And why business? As why the business man who journalism? does not right, as oh, the man who didn't want to go into business. Honestly, because marketplace called. I, I, you know, I, I, I did. <laughs> it, it's, it's totally true. I've never taken an economics course. I've never taken a business course. My wife, as I said, is the MBA. Um, I was doing general assignment after a very long stint as an intern and then a morning news producer. After about a year and a half at KQED, they finally put me on the air, uh, and I did that for six-ish months, and then. Um, uh, marketplace called. They had heard one of the programs, I, one of the broadcasts I had done uh, from San Francisco down in LA, and uh, they said, listen, we've got a job hosting our morning show. The only catch is you have to get up at midnight and go to work. And, um, and I said, sure, because, <laughs> you know, why not? Um, and, that, and that's really the reason. And, and I have to tell you, when I got that job in, uh, I guess it was 2001, I, there was no way I should have been hired, right? I didn't know jack about the global economy. I didn't know anything. And, I, and there I was explaining it to, at that point, 2.1 million people a week. Um, and, and that was insanity. Um, but, you know, I did what reporters do, right? Which is when you see a story or you don't understand what's going on, you call somebody. Uh, who knows? And, and you have them explain it to you. I called Stephen Beard, our, our guy in London, or Jocelyn Ford, our reporter then in, in um, Beijing, or any of the millions of people uh, who we have in our Rolodexes and, and uh, lists. And I called them and I said, help me understand why this matters. And then over time, you actually learn to figure it out yourself. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So it's been 10 years since the financial yeah. crisis, and I know that you've just kicked off this, actually maybe six months ago, yeah. you kicked off this Divided Decade project. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But I want to talk for a moment about how you kicked it off. You kicked it off with that incredible podcast, with the three key figures yeah. of the financial crisis, Hank Paulson, Ben Bernanke, and Tim Geithner. And I'm sure many of you have listened to this already in preparation for today's session. But for those who haven't, um, tell the folks a little bit about what that experience is like, having all three of those guys together in one room 10 years later, it, and, and what came from it. it. It was actually really interesting because we started booking these guys probably now a year ago. Uh, Bridget Bonner, one of our producers, started making phone calls, and she called them individually and said, listen, we'd like to get Chairman Bernanke, Secretary Geithner, Secretary Paulson, we'd like to get you on the air and, and talk about your experiences. I've uh, had Henry Paulson, Hank Paulson on Marketplace a couple of times, so he and I have a, a, you know, a, a relationship, if you will, sort of, uh, and he clearly had a decent uh, experience because uh, about two or three months after Bridget started booking, 
she got a call from Paulson's person who said, listen, Hank has been talking to Ben and Tim, uh, and they want to do this together. And we said, all right. Uh, and so, very, uh, so come to March of uh, this past year, those three were in New Haven at the Yale uh, School of Management, where Geithner has a side gig, doing some 10 years later conference, off the record conference, with all the people that they were in the room with 10 years ago. And that went a day and a half. It broke up at noon on a Tuesday. And then they came to see me and, you know, our production squad uh, right afterward. And it was really interesting. And I think if you've listened to it, I think this comes through. They were clearly uh, relaxed and uh, at ease talking about these things as opposed to what often happens when you get a person of that reputation and stature in the room. They are on edge and guarded. They had been coming from a really safe place for them, right? Uh, and so we all sat down and, and if you've heard the tape, you know this. They were in uh, sport coats with no ties. And I made a little joke about loosening my tie. And I, I did loosen my tie. And I took <laughs> off my coat and all this. And it, we just literally, we talked for an hour and 10 minutes without stopping. And it was completely fascinating. We, we put it on the podcast. And then we broke it up. And we ran it, um, I guess, 10-ish minutes a day for about five days. Uh, and, and I think most fundamentally, they just wanted to be understood. Uh, they wanted to be heard for a new audience, right? Because think about how many people who are savvy about the news today, for them the financial crisis was, was this thing that either passed them by or was, you know, they were doing something else with their lives. Uh, I think they wanted to be heard on why they did what they did. Um, and and I, I think and I hope that came through. Uh, excellent. So that was the way you kicked off Divided Decade. Mm -hmm. Why that project? And tell us a little bit more about it. Well, well so look, I mean, it, it's, first of all, it's the defining economic event of the past two generations, easy, right? Um, and I think just for that, it has to be honored and remembered. But more fundamentally, uh, it changed almost everything about this economy, right? It changed people's lives. It changed our institutions. It changed our government. Uh, it changed the way people think about their futures uh, in, a, in a core, fundamental, economic security sense. Uh, and especially now, with as fast as news and current events are moving, uh, we thought it was, and we believe it is, uh, required of us, uh, because if you step back and think about our mission, right? Improving the economic intelligence of this country. We believe it is required of us that we uh, help people remember what it was all about and what it did to this economy, especially now as, because people forget, we are seeing things happen in a regulatory sense and in a political sense that, while not making a crisis more likely, certainly is doing nothing to avoid the possibility of another severe crisis. That's why. And so what is it? What are you doing? What kinds of stories are you looking for? What so, are some stories you've told? So, so my favorite uh, are the stories uh, literally called, we're, we're tagging it, How We Changed. And we're, we're telling people, asking people on social media and on the air and on any format we can think of to pull out their smartphones, hit that voice memo function, and just tell us how their lives changed. And we've had... Everybody from um, people who, who, st who started a, uh, a hog farm because they couldn't uh, pay for graduate school. I don't know how that calculus works out, but, but, she, <laughs> but she's happy now, right? And, and, and that fundamentally is, is all that matters in, in your personal economy. Um, to uh, a guy just the other day, we had, we had a horrible, well, not a horrible, I mean, it was real and true, but he, he, had, um, he was 17 when the crisis hit. Um, he went to college, dropped out of college, went back, incurred a bunch of debt, and, and the kicker from his story was, I don't even know why college matters anymore. It's not worth it. It's not worth my time. Um, and, and when those things are happening, right, that has trickle-down effects in not the economy of today, 10 years after the crisis, but the economy, economy of 10 years from now, right? Because that guy's earning power, that guy's kids' earning power, all of those things are affected by the decisions he made as an 18-year-old in the face of the worst crisis in a generation. Uh, and, and so as you think about, and, and as Jennifer and I talked about a month or two ago in yeah. our call, as you think about 
the storytelling power of economic stories, the thing that really sticks with you is how lasting those decisions are, right? Decisions made in times of economic stress affect not just you, uh, but th the fortunes and fates uh, of those who come after you, and that's huge. So you said, and I believe correctly, that the financial crisis was by far the biggest economic yeah. event for two generations. Yeah. How far into the future do you think its ripple effects will carry? You know, it's really funny. I remember five years after the crisis, six years after the crisis, and some news item would come up that was clearly a, a response to something that had to happen in the crisis, whether it was a regulatory move or a political move or some company had done something. And I said, well, here we go again. The crisis is back. And it was only, you know, five years after the crisis. And, and now we're doing it again with moves in the Congress to loosen up uh, the Volcker Rule and things like that. Look, if I'm still hosting Marketplace in, in 10 years, first of all, oh, my God. But, <laughs> but, but second of all, you will totally hear me say, hey, look, the financial crisis, it's still with us. You just will, because it's, it's going to be, uh, yeah. unless we've had another crisis since then, which we might. Yeah. So a downturn is different from a crisis. Sure, yeah. Do you really think we're sowing the seeds for the next crisis now, well, or so that look, we're really heading just for a downturn? Look, look, well, look, we're going to have another recession at some point. Yep. Don't know when. And we are going to have another financial crisis, because they happen. Because economies are human, because humans forget, and because humans do stupid things. I mean, everybody in this audience knows that. Uh, especially with their finances. Um, it, it's, it's honestly not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the, 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 the ameliorating thing that we can do now is uh, safeguard ourselves from the depth and severity of what happened 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? Um, where are we on subprime mortgage loans? Where are we on uh, people taking equity out of their houses and not putting on a new roof but buying a BMW? Right? Where are we on complex securitizations? All of those things. All of those things are indicators of us not remembering what happened. Yeah. Cue the stormy weather track. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, how much of that, though, is really about not remembering and versus um, trends uh, that are 30, 40 years in the making? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, none of this happens in isolation. And, and the things that happened in 2008, the seeds had been sown years and years and years ago. So, so I, I can't answer the question of how much is what, but what I can yeah. answer is we forget at our peril. Yeah. We forget at our peril. So I want to shift us a little bit and talk, a, talk about what corporate America's role is in all of this. And I don't know, for those of you who saw the Wall Street Journal today, you might have seen that uh, Jamie Dimon and, and Warren Buffett responded immediately to my keynote <laughs> yesterday by announcing that they think all companies should stop issuing short-term guidance. So, you know, job well done. I, I'd pat you on the back, but you're too far away. <laughs> um, boy, timing is everything, it isn't is, it? It is, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Uh, uh, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you about um, uh, Larry Fink's letter. Now I can oh, ask yeah. you about this op-ed. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but let's step back for a second from the news of the moment and talk about like, what is corporate America's role in all of this? Um, so, so here's the thing, right? And um, uh, it's actually really interesting, given especially the um, way that. Uh, Congress and the White House now have decided since the election to favor companies in this economy over individuals. Um, it, th the reality is that we have somehow decided in this economy that corporations do not have a social responsibility, all they have is a shareholder responsibility. Um, and that uh, the line you hear from boards of directors and CEOs is, it is our obligation. We are required to maximize shareholder value. As everybody in this room knows, that's not actually in the law anywhere. Um, surprise! <laughs> uh, but, but it flies with a lot of people, in part because, you know, uh, mea culpa here, there's a lot of emphasis on the stock market in this economy and how things are going, and using that as an indicator of, listen, the stock market's up, everything must be great, even though we all know, dear Mr. President, that markets go down too. 
right? Um, I don't know that in the short term there will be a trend or a push to make companies realize that there are so, and, and yes, I'm painting with a very broad brush here, right? But to make companies realize that there's a social obligation uh, as well, and that part of their fortune, uh, in all the senses of that word, comes from uh, their workforce, their customers, uh, and, and the values that a uh, capitalist democracy provides. I hadn't really thought about that before, that you know, you always lead in with where are the markets. Does well, so, so here's the reality, right? Let me get right? the, the, the actual radio truth of it is that um, we only have 28 minutes and 45 seconds from the gong to the time I say, see you tomorrow, everybody. Um, uh, and, and that's not a whole lot of time. So if I go long in an interview or there's a glitch or a reporter comes in two minutes before air with a story that's a minute and a half instead of three minutes or whatever it is, we need an accordion. And the numbers are the accordion, right? So they're in the, they're in the rundown every day for 45 seconds. But I can go 20, or I can go a minute and a half. Uh, and that's why they're there. So we, we, we need that accordion, if you in, did, my, in my defense. If you didn't need an accordion, yeah. or if there was a different, if we could design a different right. one, right. Um, in a way, I just hadn't thought about it until now that it is sort of emblematic of the problem. Have you yeah. ever have you ever thought about oh uh, ditching not, it or shifting not every it? day but frequently we say well, maybe we should get rid of this huh. you know but but look I'm not going to say it now because it's not a toy but when you think of marketplace what's the phrase you think of there you go <laughs> right people always say to me hey can you say it for us and I'm like no man it's not a toy <laughs> yeah on my answering machine uh, nah, right? uh, nope um, so. I want, to, I want to get a feel for where you are on whether you think companies are actually starting to shift. We've seen certainly a shift in companies being willing to speak out, right? We had Citi and Bank of America on guns. We had ABC on Roseanne. Uh, we had Ken Merck. I mean, Ken but, Fraser but, but, from but, Merck. But, but, but wait, but wait. If you're going to go to the Roseanne thing, I mean, look, I hear you on the big banks and guns, right? But look, if they were serious they would say, look, you may not use our payment systems for gun purchases, full stop, right? So, look, I, let, let's not make it a value judgment, right? I mean, that, that's, if they were serious, that's what they would do, right? Um, even though it is a constitutionally protected right, banks are private companies, there's no, you know, obligation, right? So, so that's fine. And if they were serious, they would do that. Uh, on the Roseanne thing and ABC, Come on. I know. Right? Not, a I mean, yeah. Not a fair comparison. Not a fair comparison. And they hired her knowing full well. Yeah. And, and it still took them three hours to fire her. Right. <laughs> so, so you think these are blips. You think Larry Fink's letter and this nice op-ed today, very nice, but not necessarily the real deal. Right. So you all know about Larry Fink's letter, right? We don't have to explain that? Okay. Uh, I don't know. I should, and I should have looked it up before I came. Has Larry Fink actually done anything about it? Has he divested? Has he taken any steps since that letter? Right. Uh, when is J.P. Morgan's next, conference, next earnings call? That, that'll be the indicator. Okay. You know, right? put up or shut up, right? Yeah. I've, been, I've been calling J.P. Morgan Chase for 15 years to get Jamie Dimon on the program. I, I'm sure I would call him tomorrow and say, listen, we'd love to talk about this, and he won't call me back. Are there okay. J.P. Morgan Chase people in the audience? There probably there are. are. Right? <laughs> right? You know. Let, let me just say for the record, I'd throw him a question or two on this thing and then a whole bunch of other questions. Okay. You know. Game on. Well, you know. Jamie Dimon, you've been invited. All right, we'll see what happens. Let's shift a little bit. Let's talk about the role of Marketplace and other media outlets in this crazy time, uh, do you think the media is actually helping or is it making it worse? So can, can we... Um, can we talk? Can, so look, <laughs> um, I think that's a complicated question, right? I know, that's and, why I, I and, I, and I think it's important that we, we separate the varying kinds of media. And I want to especially ring fence, if I could, cable news. Because cable news in this environment um, is, generally speaking, um, a huge part of the issue. Uh, because they have to fill 
they are given to hyperbole, beating things into the ground, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, irrelevant he said, she saids, those kinds of things. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, at the same time, you have Maggie Haberman for the New York Times, probably the most plugged in and connected other than Robert Costa of the Washington Post, White House reporter on this planet. Um, consistently breaking news that the White House denies and then uh, shows up to be true. Um, they are not fake media. It is not fake news. It is real. Uh, and then you have those of us, um, and I'll speak specifically for Marketplace here. I won't speak for public radio writ large, right? Those of us whose job is to contextify, if I may, uh, what is happening specifically in business and economics. Um, and we take a great deal of time and energy thinking about how not to sensationalize, but to make people understand the import of what is happening at this particular moment. And all moments, but this one in particular, because there is such pressure on the news media. Um, are we part of the problem? Sure. Are we also part of the solution and part of the whole representative democracy thing and informed voters? Yes. So we were talking about this backstage, actually. I think one of the problems is that we've all decamped yeah. into our uh, uh, media yeah, outlet totally. of political choice. Yep. Uh, and you now have, I think, what, 14 million mm -hmm. listeners? Um, you can't tell me that isn't a bubble. I mean, no, I mean, totally. SNL has made fun of the NPR listener. Right? Totally, right. So and, and look, I laughed. I laughed. Let me, go, let me go on my little toot here, and then I'll answer the question. Um, I believe it is our responsibility as citizens of a representative democracy to be informed. To do that, you can't just listen to NPR. You can't just listen to MSNBC in prime time. You may not do that. Right? You are obliged to listen to Fox News. How many people in this audience have ever spent an hour watching Sean Hannity? Yeah, there's like a dozen hands up. Right? There's a dozen hands up. And it makes me sad every time. Look, but, but, but at least you, she said it makes me sad every time. But at least you know and understand what millions and millions and millions of people in this economy watch, listen to, and believe. And that's essential. You have to. I was sitting next to a woman of a certain age at a function not too long ago, and I gave this very speech, and she said, ah, oh, I can't. He's obscene. And I'm like, look, lady. I said, look, ma'am, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I believe you really have to. Please do me a favor and just go home and do this. And I would encourage everybody in this audience to watch Tucker Carlson, to watch uh, Rachel Maddow, to watch Sean Hannity, do that, Chris Hayes, do that. And then you can understand both sides of the discussion. I think that's critical. Now, as to the bubble of people who listen to me and public radio at large, it's a huge problem, and, and we know it. And look, Marketplace is a mature program, and not only am I not going to get more core public radio listeners, just because that's the way radio dynamics work, I don't necessarily want more public, core public radio listeners, right? I want people who are 20. I want some, uh, uh, you know, minority, diversity, young or, frankly, old person to listen to my program and say, hey, this matters. I hadn't really thought about that. How do you do that? How do you, I mean... I learn how to speak Spanish or Tagalog or, you know, take your pick, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's really, really, really hard. You have to meet the audience where they are, on demand. You have to do things that are different. I don't know if any of you have listened to a podcast I do with Molly Wood, who hosts our tech program. So, so public radio and, and marketplace, we do very, you know, polished public radio-y kind of stories, good ambient and this and that, and, and the hosts and anchors are reasonably controlled, although I am less controlled than most public radio hosts. Um, it, Molly and I let our hair down uh, a, a tad, and you hear a more human side of us, uh, and hopefully that's more engaging to more people. And it's more accessible because we're putting it out there on demand. Yeah. So that reminds me that there's a, a topic or a theme that we kind of forgot about that we should spend a few minutes talking about, which is technology. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us more about this show, this podcast that you're well, doing so, and where so it came from. And Molly Wood is our uh, technology correspondent. She hosts uh, our uh, program called Market Tech, Marketplace Tech, which and uh, that's a podcast as well. But it's... Um, it's more trends in technology than technology news. Uh, but what we, as part of um, trying to broaden our base, as it were, if I could talk in political terms, 
um, we realized that we needed to break out of the traditional public radio mold, as I said a minute ago, of uh, reasonably straightforward um, hosting and presentation, and let people see that we are real people. Now, to the point of, of technology, right, right? I mean, Molly Wood's written for the New York Times. She's been in technology for 20 years. She's, she's an incredibly well-informed technology person, but what she does is talk about technology in our lives, whether it's blockchain, uh, whether it's, you know, buying a, a house on your phone, which apparently you can do now because we need that in this economy. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that's what, that's, that's, I mean, right? That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're going after. Um, and given the topics we've been talking about, yeah. where does tech fit in? Uh, uh, they're obviously a massive part of the story, oh, but yeah. how much are they a part of the problem? Uh, well, so look, when you get, let's, let's break it out, right? You've got really useful and functional, subjective response coming. You've got really useful and, and uh, functional things like Venmo, right? Uh, which is kind of amazing. It's Dan, kind of extraordinary. Dan Schulman will be very happy to hear I, that. I, I think it's remarkable, right? And, and let me say again, I don't use it because my wife handles all of my money and, and all of our money, I mean, whatever. Um, but I think it's incredible. And I, you know, we don't have to give our kids allowances anymore. And when the kids go for pizza, they, you know, I mean, and you all know this. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, though, are things like, and, and um, you know, I, I just recorded an interview with um, Spencer Raskoff at uh, Zillow, and they're getting into, they're, they're moving toward a place where you can buy a house on your phone. I don't think we need that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. So I think technology is incredible, as with all technology in the financial services sector, Parts of it are incredibly helpful, and parts of it are perhaps not quite fully baked. So the last topic I wanted to turn to, and this is actually a nice segue because we could talk about technology as well, um, is this issue of declining trust. Yeah. So it's certainly easy to talk about declining trust in media, and we'll go there in a minute. I'm sure, <laughs> oh, good. Oh, yeah. good. Let's do more of that. I'm sure you'll have another Sorry, only seven minutes box. left. That's right, what the clock exactly. says. Um, but I think this is a really interesting topic to talk about as it relates to technology. Um, on the one hand, you could say people have blindly trusted it. Yeah. In the, on the other, you can say, well, uh, the come up it's, it's coming uh, or is here. Um, how do you think about uh, how do you think about that issue? So let me do another quick survey, if I might. How many uh, people in this room have deleted Facebook from their uh, phones? Wow, that's more than wow. I would have thought. It's it's still like a couple of dozen people. Uh, it's more than who said they'd listen to Sean yeah, Kennedy. Though, that's, that's right. right? <laughs> that's right. Um, look, I, I and, and Molly disagrees with me on this, and we've actually had this conversation uh, on the air, as it were, a couple of times. Um, there is a personal responsibility aspect to the trust in technology that I think is being missed. And anybody who now does not have their eyes fully open, and Facebook is the biggest example, but there are many, mm -hmm. many others, Quick story, so my 11-year-old uh, daughter, uh, we got her a phone, I know, for her birthday, right? <laughs> but look, she's going down to the high school next year, it's a whole, it's a whole, whole parent, thing. it's a whole parent thing. <laughs> anyway, she said, Dad, Dad, can I get this Bitmoji app? And I said, sure, sweetie, whatever. She makes these fun little Bitmojis. And then, to get the Bitmoji keyboard that lets you actually do the Bitmojis, apparently, one of the privacy disclosures is, the users, of, the makers of this app will be able to see everything you have typed on this keyboard, past, present, and future. What? So I have to ask, what led you to read the privacy statement? <laughs> Shame on me, it popped up. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have gone into it. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, that's nutty, right? So, so the point being, anybody who gets into technology now in any substantive personal way who doesn't understand what's going on or, or uh, complains about it, hasn't been paying attention, yeah. right? And, and I think, look, it goes, to, it goes to the media thing, it goes to a whole bunch of things. I think, I think there is a, there's, a, there's a trust mechanism in this economy and in this society that's, that's a little bit fractured. Well, and, and we're not really gonna harp on trust in the media because I believe that it's absolutely just broadly symptomatic of yeah. lack of trust yeah. in all institutions. Yep. And listen, remember, I'm a former journalist, I'm on your side, yep. Uh, yep. you know, I remember the good old days. Um, my question is on this trust thing, uh, how do we stem the tide? Or do we think that we've got a current crop of institutions that can actually be reformed? 
or do we need to raise them all and rebuild? So look, don't, don't impart any partisan meaning to this. I'm serious. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we have elected political leaders in this country who are actively undermining trust in our institutions, government institutions, social institutions, and institutions of the fourth estate. And that's a huge problem. And until the electorate writ large decides that they're not going to tolerate that anymore, then I don't understand what can be done. Because I can jump up and down every day in front of the microphone. And, you know, anybody else who, who has access to a platform can do the same thing. But, but people have to decamp from where they have been decamped to, right, and come together with some, with some civic purpose. And I don't know what the answer is to that dilemma. To be fair, as much as I agree with what you just said, this predates the current administration. This, this declining trust yeah. in institutions, uh, declining trust in government. Congress hasn't been functioning for absolutely what, true. at least a decade, maybe? Absolutely true. Um, but I also think that we somehow expect this trust to be engendered by government. And I'm wondering what other kinds of social mechanisms, community mechanisms, where else can we, um, can we look, I think, to rebuild the seeds of trust? Um, how many of you remember that essay from, God, it's got to be 25 years ago now, uh, Bowling Alone from that guy at Harvard, right? He spoke at our conference a couple years ago. Well, so you know him, Robert Richard. Robert Todd. Putnam. Right. Um, I thought that was amazing and prescient and all kinds of incredible. Um, there has to be, and look, I don't have the answer and I don't know what it is, yeah. but there needs to be a mechanism by which this society can come together at a grassroots kind of level without partisan uh, uh, irrelevance, right, and decide what's important. We have to decide what's important. Yeah. So as we close out today, can you give us any hints about what's going to be on the program today? He's no, because I'm to here. Go. you kidding me? I, you know, I was on the conference call this morning, and it was a lousy connection. I have no idea. What's, I'm going to walk in and go, oh, we're doing that? That's the luck of the draw sometimes, right? You, yeah. you know, I have, I have a very, very good executive producer, and she, she takes really good care of me. Yeah. Well, everyone, please help me uh, thank Kai Ridstall. Thanks for coming. <laughs>